Welcome to this uh, seminar on managing financial stress and restructuring in higher education from Evershed's offices at 1 Wood Street in London in the centre of the city. Great. Th thank you very much, Neil. Um, I, I guess the sort of uh, first thing that we want to, to, to say is that there's no doubt we're about to enter into some very difficult times here. I think if you look at the further education space, there, there's been a huge number of mergers in further education. So a lot of track record in further education as to what might be coming into, into higher education if there are any funding cuts. And I will actually pick up uh, an issue which was raised about you know England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, the cross-border part of that, because I, th I think it's very relevant. But before getting to that, I guess it's important to note that not all higher education institutions have the same powers. I mean, you've got five or six different legal forms from royal charters, companies limited by guarantee, companies limited by shares. You've even got one, Church of England Trust, so that there is still a governing body that's in fact actually composed of people who, who are acting as trustees of a Church of England Trust, which, you know, if you look at the risks, that uh, the financial risks that perhaps we're about to sort of uh, go through, perhaps is not a very sensible place to be. And there's also a large number of institutions set up under various Acts of Parliament. And therefore, you need to start looking at what the powers uh, are set out in those, in those Acts of Parliament. So you've got a, a very diverse sector in terms of powers, which means that some institutions can do things that others cannot do. And therefore, having sort of one size fits all for the sector is completely the wrong approach, actually. And that's, that's putting to one side the devolved administration's issue. So even when you're looking at any financial stresses and strains, you need to start by looking at, at what your legal form is. And I think as senior management move from one institution to another, often they're not cute to this. Actually. So they think that what happened at one institution, they can do something similar at, at different institutions. And that isn't always the case. And if you look at some of the ultravirus cases, some of the bond issues going back to you know, the sort of late eight, 80s or so, you can see some examples of that. So what will happen with funding cuts from the public sector, or at least from the student purse, is that, is that obviously institutions will start looking elsewhere for funding sources, putting to one side the ability to carry out cuts. And, and actually, there's been a lot of focus so far on group structures, hasn't there? And uh, the government, the, the Department of Education, has paid for a number of these group structures to be set up, formal group structures. So Bolton, University of Bolton, has, has actually got a group structure with Bolton College in it. You've, um, <coughs> you've actually got the London South Bank of Lambeth about to be set up in Hartbury as well as Hartbury College, as was, was divided into two, a higher education institution and a further education institution. So it itself is a group structure. And that obviously is a good thing in some ways. You, you may argue, well, that will sort of help to diversify risk. But obviously, at the on the other extreme, it can increase the risk because you may be taking on unknown risks. So you've certainly got group structures. You mentioned schools, actually. So you've got some higher education institutions that are sort of uh, run multi-academy trusts. Um, so you've got schools. You've also got some uh, further education in there as well. Um, so, so there's the chance of increased amount of risk as well as the reward. And on top of that, you've got a number of institutions that are looking to sort of delve into the private sector as well. They're actually looking to take over uh, institutions from the private sector. And I think if we add to that all the new powers from the OFS and all the new entrants that we are uh, going to see, uh, actually, uh, the, the, uh, I'll give a prize to anybody who can tell me there's one British higher education institution that's actually set up as an American 501c3, so it's not even a British company. It's an American company governed by American law. So, so it shows that you've got a, got a very diverse sector here, and that's, that's the putting to one side these new entrants that are coming in. I remember George Osborne when he was chancellor saying that there's 22 billion pounds of American private equity money looking to come into the sector. So we'll see whether that comes in or not. Um, but on the other side of this is that when you, if you seek to wind up these institutions, it's not, it's not obvious how you can wind them up. Um, we've got a number of counters opinions, actually from some QCs on whether you can wind, wind up a Royal Charter Corporation. It's uncertain law. And at Cardiff University, obviously in the 70s, almost went past. And, and, and when they started looking at the, the, the power of a bank or other creditor to wind up an institution like, like that, it's, it's certainly not obvious. So from a, a funding and lending point of view, you may see that sort of banks start to look at this in a much more cautious way, uh, even more so if the OFS is true to its word uh, and actually there's no further support uh, from, the, uh, from the sector. The other side of it, I, I just want to quickly focus on, if I may, is, is uh, what the role of governors of institutions are. Because 
it's a very difficult place, I think, now for an individual to act as a governor of an institution that may be facing some financial failure. We're starting to see in further education, actually from 31st of January of next year, the new Technical and Further Education Act comes into force, which uh, allows further education colleges, corporations, to be, to be wound up, and the governors having some personal liability under uh, the Insolvency Act, or s something similar to the Insolvency Act. At the moment, we're not seeing similar rules uh, being planned or proposed for the higher education sector, for HECs, which is a large number of uh, higher education institutions. But we may see that, and that may actually cause a, a flight of governors. So, so actually, some of these stresses may be around whether you'll be able to get the right types of governing bodies. I promised, uh, and I've only got a couple more minutes, I know, to talk about the sort of impact of the cross-border work. And we used to talk about cross-border as a sort of Britain to outside the world, but now we actually look a lot at the interplay between the uh, rules between Wales, Scotland, England, and Northern Ireland. And actually, uh, an interesting point is if a Welsh institution was to merge with an English institution, would that then be an English institution or a Welsh institution or both? Because the law does not cover it. It assumes that an institution is one of English, Welsh, Scottish, or Northern Irish, and that isn't the case at all. In fact, there's an interesting trick that is now possible under the, under the new rules under the Higher Education Research Act that a Welsh or Scottish or Northern Irish institution could, I think, establish an English institution. It could enter into a validation with that English institution, a wholly owned company, and it could then tap into the English loan system. So you could actually have Welsh students, therefore, able to get higher rates of funding through the English funding system than might otherwise be the case. So there's no doubt that actually looking at, at it from a devolved point of view also adds a degree of complexity. The last point I just want to make on stresses and trains is, is around the, uh, the overseas side. And um, it, I, I think it's very few institutions that actually make any money from international campuses. Often it's a flag on a map. They do well to, to cover their costs on the whole. Um, but if you look at the big British market, which is the Chinese market, um, there's been a very recent change in the policy of the, of the Chinese uh, government around these uh, joint ventures or programs with British institutions that they've now insisted on clauses in the contract which requires you to comply with the Communist Party tenure plan. And that includes setting up uh, local branches of the Communist Party on your campus. So, you know, from a British institution point of view, how many British institutions are going to want to sign up to something like that? So again, the international market may perhaps not be the, the great panacea that people have seen it to be in the past. This issue of uh, personal liability, um, how, what, how significant uh, an impact do you think that that kind of development, which you can see in areas of further education, can have. And do people taking on these very prestigious roles in universities sometimes not understand uh, the responsibilities and liabilities that they may be taking on if things become difficult? I, th I think you ra raise a, a range of, of uh, very difficult and complex issue actually. I think a lot of people join governing bodies because they want to help the institution um, uh, without actually thinking through exactly what the obligations are with it. Of course there hasn't been a failure of an English higher education institution in the last uh, few years and where there were some failures of institutions or possible failures what happened in the past is those institutions were merged with somebody else and that's what we think will happen but there haven't been that many mergers in the higher education sector in the UK for, for many years. Um, whether there'll be more will be interesting to see. So what we need to do, Neil, is to look at what has happened in the further education sector uh, and, and to see what's happened to governors there. Um, in other instances, I think people assume that if there is uh, institutions in difficulty, there will be um, some arm twisting to get other people to help support and certainly work out um, what to do about the uh, student protection plans but there's no real legal basis for that any more than there was in in the banking crash in the 70s when the governor of the bank of england had to form a lifeboat from the biggest of the mainstream banks um, glenn do you think that if uh, a number of institutions or particular ones in in say the northwest got into difficulty that the big institutions might step up to try and protect the reputation of the area uh, or the reputation of the system? 
I think the, the problem with it, I think they may want to do that, but the problem is that uh, certainly if they're not-for-profit in the charities sector, they have to support their own charitable objects. So charitable objects are for yourself, it's not to support another institution. So the question is, how would it support its own charitable objects to actually save another institution? So actually I think what is a more likely thing to happen is that there may be a private sector buyer for it, a, a university of law uh, type issue. Actually there has been a British institution that was sold recently, NCH, which was bought by North Northeastern University, which is an American mm -hmm. university. So so that was an institution that was financially weak. You look at the accounts to see how weak it was, but but here you've got a big American university, a, a, you know, world-class institution coming into the market. So I suspect it may not be those in the area. You may have those who want to get into the UK market, and that is an, an, an obvious way into the market for them. Uh, uh, that's a, I mean, that is a very interesting point about charitable institutions, because we now have an activist uh, charity commission, which is very strict. Uh, that almost implies that if charity begins at home, it has to stay at home. And even if they wanted to help, they might not be allowed to, or they might not have the powers to. Um, that seems to be interesting. Indeed, indeed that, that's right. And, and I guess I just want to add to it is, is that it's uncertain what the impact of end ups is going to have on this. Because a lot of the private sector is pumping money into the public sector through validation and franchise agreements around DAPs. And actually, if they start getting end ups in their own right and they have strong brands, in their own name, then actually you can see that they don't need any more to use the degree awarding mm. powers of those institutions. So you may see the turning off of the tap to an extent of these validation and franchise ventures, <coughs> which a lot of institutions have actually used as a great source of income to, to support them over the, over the piece. A potential um, sort of, uh, I guess, takeover or buying out of an institution. What about the sort of where there's a sort of quite significant, you know, there might be a, an exchequer interest in terms of, um, you know, investments, public investments in the past and infrastructure. There's obviously a public interest in terms of things like degree awarding powers. What about those sort of public assets? How does that, how would that work in, in terms of a, um, a more sort of commercial interest? I mean, you raise an interesting point, actually. And if you look back 10 years ago, there were no rules at all about this. Effectively, to offer uh, or to operate an English HEI, there's four separate regulated rights that you need. One is degree awarding powers, one is university title, one is the right to access student funding, and the fourth one is the right to bring in international students in tier four rights. So, so those are the package of bundle of rights that if you're a private equity investor, you are look, looking at those rights. And actually there are no rules in place around change of control for each of those four areas. So in terms of you know, how is the public purse covered off, there are rules, So there's, and actually interesting enough, they're not the same rules. So a lot of our work is actually looking at why the change of control, what they call the change of control rules, are different for UK VI compared to university title, compared to sort of student funding course designation, it's called call at the moment, or institutional designation. Now, one would hope that with the OFS, this might get a little simpler, but of course that means that the barriers to entry and therefore the competitors that might come into this marketplace, the Conservative government is clear this is a marketplace, nothing more or less than that. Therefore, you know, the actual pressure on institutions is going to be stark. What we haven't talked about is the single biggest cost to the e English uh, higher education sector moment, which is pensions. You know, I mean, you know, how many school leavers, and our school leavers, can actually join uh, an employer uh, at 16 can actually sign in and actually get a final salary pension scheme which they can then carry on right to the age of 65. Now again, and I'm sorry to keep looking at the further education sector but I think, I think the parallels are stark there. We have a good line in business at the moment in terms of bringing staff outside of those final salary pension schemes because the cost of maintaining those schemes is simply too high uh, and it's very straightforward to, to actually do that. Um, and, and therefore, if you're trying to compete with uh, a rival down the road whose cost base is much lower, then, then actually it becomes very difficult. Now, the argument against it, of course, is, well, you won't get the right staff because those staff won't move unless they can, they can access that pension. Well, that may be true in the short term, but is that true in the medium or long term? But Glenn, one of your predictions was that if an institution was stressed and was beginning to doubt its future, that... Uh, it might well be uh, an overseas or 
a financial buyer that might come in rather than other institutions. But what you mentioned there is that they would need to get very quick approval from four regulators for degree awarding powers, title, access to loans, uh, and overseas T4. Um, who's going to round up all of those quickly if somebody wants to make a, a reasonably quick deal? Indeed, and at the moment, uh, actually the sort of standard response times for UK VI is 18 weeks. So they say that they, they won't deal with anything within 18 weeks. So you're quite right, if something was to, to fail very, very fast, then actually there would be a role for, for government at that point in time to come in and actually say, we want this to happen. Now, against the sort of type of free market that we've established, it's kind of difficult to see that that government intervention can be, can be very strong or stark. Thank you for joining us and thank our online viewers. And uh, we'd welcome comments and discussion afterwards. And please feel free to write in and tell us anything we've missed because that'll be the next programme. So uh, from all of us at Eversheds, with particular thank you to Glenn and his colleagues for uh, hosting us uh, and uh, providing the facilities today. And from Chris and Julie and James and all the participants who've come, uh, thank you very much and see you soon.